I mean, it hasn't been, you know, from from their point of view, both those and Sushi, and also, you know, I mean, it hasn't been a type of disastrous relationship. I think in the beginning, in 2016, there have been overtures by both sides to see if they could get along. And the Rohingya crisis, violence, specifically, was an issue on which I think they kind of came together to some extent. But I think that never really removed that fundamental difference, which was that the army felt that with this constitution and in general, they were the paramount power and should be respected as such in the country. Whereas Aung San Suu Kyi and the NLD's core mission was to change the constitution and create a democracy, which would have meant the army being under an elected government and an elected head of government. And uh, more from the author and historian, Than Thien Yu, coming up in a moment. You're listening to the BBC World Service. I'm Julian Marshall and this is News Hour. And still to come on news out, we'll hear a space rocket powered by biofuel. So is this the first manure in space? <laughs> Our seizure slots begin with fuel, but we can say that the substances can be found from farms not only across America, but truly across the world. And uh, the latest headlines from the BBC newsroom, there's unease and anger in Myanmar after the military seized power, detaining the country's democratically elected leaders. Foreign governments and international organizations have condemned the coup. The wife of the Russian opposition leader, Alexei Navalny, has been fined for taking part in mass protests, calling for his release from prison. And the price of silver has risen to an eight-year high after calls on social media for amateur investors to buy the metal. You're listening to the BBC World Service. I'm Julian Marshall and this is News Hour. And let's return to Myanmar and hear more now from prominent historian and author Thant Min Yu in Yangon. I talked to him about the condemnation of the by foreign governments and asked him whether Aung San Suu Kyi's tainted international reputation following her defense of the military campaign in Rakhine State could have weakened her position. One thing that we have to always remember is how isolated the elites in Myanmar have been. I mean, this is a country that was isolated from the rest of the world for, for decades and then came under sanctions. So I think if you spend, you know, if one spends any time in Ecuador and meets a lot of senior governments people, you're really in a world that's that's almost completely cut off. So it's not, you know, it's not as if international statements and condemnation and international relations are not important to them, but it's it's far from being a major factor, I think, in their calculations. I think on, on both sides, but especially the army side, you know, Myanmar is the whole world, and I think all of their calculations, all of their friends and enemies are, are, are within the country. I mean, the army has declared a state of emergency for one year, after which it says there will be fresh elections. It's still committed to a multi-party system. Should we take them at their word? I think when they say multi-party system, they mean a multi-party system under this constitution, which the army still has. You know, a tight grip on the security sector and, and a big influence generally. And that's something that some people in the country might feel is okay, but there will be many others in the country, especially around Aung San Suu Kyi and the NLD, who think that that's wrong and that's the fundamental problem in the country that needs to change. I think a year is also a very long time in a place like Myanmar. I mean, Myanmar is a country which, like everywhere else in the world, is experiencing the pandemic, but also an acute economic crisis, which has driven tens of millions of people into extreme poverty. But it's also a country with dozens of different ethnic armed organizations, hundreds of different militia. It has an open border with China, an illicit drug trade worth tens of billions of dollars. So this is a country where political crisis if it kind of spins out of control and leads to general social unrest really has the, the potential to, to tip the country over into an even worse uh, situation than it's experienced over the past few decades. What do you mean by that? I mean that, you know, this is a country where a lot of people have weapons, there's not all-out fighting, instead there's ceasefires, or sort of informal ceasefires. You have a lot of people who are extremely unhappy, frustrated, anxious, moving around the country in their millions looking for jobs right now because income is falling precipitously over the past year and in, in particular. There are a lot of poor people who can be easily mobilized by one side or another. And in a way, you know, we've had the violence against Rohingya, we've had armed conflicts in the country, but it's a country of 55 million awash in weapons with huge illicit industries. And I think the situation could just get much worse. And, and to some extent, it is this elite compact at the center between the army and the NLD that has kept a degree or a facade of, of normalcy, which has led to foreign investment coming in, which has meant that places like Yangon and Mandalay, the two big cities, 
have an air of normality and growth and economic progress, but I that could change direction very quickly if the political crisis that we have now continues and then gets worse. That was the historian and author Thant Mentiu speaking to me from Myanmar's commercial capital, Yangon. And we have been trying to speak to the Burmese military, but without success. And uh, with so many senior NLD politicians detained, it hasn't been possible to contact them either. And let's move briefly away from Myanmar to Idlib, the last opposition-controlled province of Syria. Hard hit by war, health officials there now believe that tens of thousands of people in the region have contracted the coronavirus. There's a lack of testing facilities and considerable skepticism about vaccines. As Mike Thompson reports. Recent testing found that more than one in four people in Idlib's crowded displacement camps, like Salahadin near the Turkish border, were COVID positive. Most of the camp was infected with COVID-19. I myself have also been infected and my mother and my neighbor died because of COVID. Camp manager Abu Ayman says recent flooding and sub-zero winter temperatures have turned the difficult into near impossible and that this on top of trauma caused by a decade of conflict means that many here have simply stopped thinking about COVID-19. It is very difficult to maintain social distancing in a very crowded situation. It's too many people at a very small space and there is lack of health education. People still are shaking hands, hugging each other when greeting and they're not following preventive measures. Even some doctors sometimes, they said, okay, no need for any precautions. If there is a bump, it will take more lives than COVID. So people don't concern about COVID. Trauma surgeon Dr. Mahmoud Hariri says COVID cases seem to have dipped after peaking a few weeks ago, but he believes that a lack of testing facilities and people's fear of dying in hospital may help explain that. The total number, almost 20,000 infected. This is as per PCR test. But there is, of course, maybe 10 times this number because so many patients do not go to the hospitals or at the community isolation centers. Two thirds of Idlib's intensive care beds currently lie empty. Medics fear that with oxygen and supplies of PPE running low, the next COVID wave could overwhelm local health services here without access to vaccines. There is no confirmation whatsoever on when this vaccine will arrive. Dr. Hani Al-Tili is a member of the COVID-19 TUM. They would accept receiving the vaccine and surprisingly, half of them said no. Half of the medical Yes, said no. half of them said no. Such views aren't confined to health workers. Former civil engineering student Mohammed Sheikh, who now lives in a camp in the North Idlib countryside, has had coronavirus himself, but insists that many here won't be queuing for vaccines when they do finally arrive. It's not that we're suspicious of the vaccine itself. It's more that we don't trust the countries that have it. Why would they help us now when they did nothing to stop us being bombed and butchered for years. Ya Allah! Ya Allah! Ya Allah! Thankfully, ya Allah! most of the bombing has stopped for now, but doctors fear that if it resumes, hospitals will once again become targets, further reducing Idlib's ability to cope with another COVID wave. British consultant surgeon David Knott who's devoted much of his time to helping care for civilian casualties of war here, fears for the future. The infrastructure is minuscule compared to what we have. They're going to run out of oxygen. That's the first thing they're going to run out. 
and they don't have the ventilators that require oxygen to be driven to help the patients. And so if the population gets completely swamped with COVID, people are going to die left, right, centre. And uh, that report on Syria's Idlib province by the BBC's Mike Thompson. And uh, don't forget, if you want to listen to News Hub and this live broadcast, a podcast of the programme is available, updated twice a day. Just type into your search engine BBC News Hub podcast and you'll find it there. You can listen to a single edition or better still, subscribe to the feed for regular downloads so you'll never need to be without us. Do stay with us, though on this edition of the program. More to come in the next uh, 30 minutes, more on that military coup in Myanmar, including an interview with the former US ambassador to the country. This is the BBC World Service, where our new coronavirus frontline series follows a vaccine trial at one of the UK's five clinical trial centres. Thank you for volunteering. Welcome to Team Bradford in our race to find a vaccine for COVID-19. We've been given access to medical teams and hear their recordings as events unfold. Tuesday the 6th of October. The pandemic is clearly here to stay. And there is only one way out. Bradford is at the forefront of the search, probably the greatest scientific race of all time. As fast as we are digging the graves, we're filling them up. We hear from the volunteers. I trust science, I trust the process. And about the efforts to dispel vaccine myths, particularly among Bradford's South Asian community. They're actually scared. They've heard lots of rumors. It's just all misconceptions that we're trying to correct. Coronavirus Frontline, the search for a vaccine. Tuesday at 9 and 20 GMT. Coming up on News Hour in the next 30 minutes, more on the military coup in Myanmar and the detention of elected leader Aung San Suu Kyi. Will the military now renew its campaign against Rohingya Muslims, hundreds of thousands of whom have already been forced to flee the country? And we'll speak to the former US ambassador to Myanmar. That's all coming up after the latest news. BBC News with Gareth Barlow. A military coup in Myanmar has seen banks closed, telecommunications interrupted and transport links shut down. The country's democratically elected leaders have been detained and troops are reported to have surrounded guest houses in the capital, where MPs were staying ahead of the planned reopening of parliament. The army said it had seized power because last November's election was rigged. There's been widespread condemnation of the coup. India, Japan and the United States are among those who called for democracy to be respected. Bangladesh says it expects negotiations with Myanmar about the repatriation of more than a million Rohingya refugees to continue. In other world news, a leading humanitarian aid official has criticized the Ethiopian authorities for restricting access to victims of the conflict in the northern Tigray region. Gunn Aiglin said he'd rarely seen an aid response impeded so much. The Ugandan opposition politician Bobby Wine has filed a legal challenge against the outcome of last month's presidential election, which he says was rigged. The incumbent Yari Museveni, who came to power in 1986, won with 58% of the votes to Bobby Wine's 35%. The wife of the Russian opposition activist Alexei Navalny says she'll appeal against a fine imposed joining nationwide protests in support of him. Yulia, Yulia Navalnaya's lawyer said the court had not published its reason for fining her $260. She was among those detained near the Moscow prison where her husband is being held. The price of silver has reached its highest for eight years. It's the latest market to be targeted by amateur investors. And the European Union's law enforcement agency has warned that criminals are selling fake COVID-19 test certificates to avoid travellers, to avoid travellers avoiding restrictions on movement. Europol says it has information about a number of incidents across Europe. BBC News. You're listening to News Hour. Not all space launches are large, expensive and powered by traditional rocket fuel. On Sunday, the Stardust One became the first commercial rocket uh, powered by a bio-derived fuel using a secret ingredient found on farms. Now, what could that possibly be? Jane O'Brien reports from the former Loring Air Force Base in Maine. 
In a disused military building that once housed fighter jets, a very different type of aircraft is being loaded onto a trailer on the back of a pickup truck to be towed onto the runway. Stardust One is a rocket designed by Blue Shift, a small startup company in Maine that has just claimed a global first. Sasha Derry is the chief executive. We are the first company in the world that we're aware of to launch commercially a rocket using a bio-derived fuel. So what's in it? <laughs> Our secret sauce we can't reveal, but we can say that the substances can be found from farms not only across America, but truly across the world. Five, four, three, two, one. Ignition sequence started. Yes, go. Oh my gosh. First launch, Stardust One flew a mile into the sky before returning. Compared to other commercial rockets that now ferry astronauts to the space station, it is very small and cheap to fly. That, though, makes space accessible to many more people. This launch carried experiments from a college and a business that wants to test an alloy for vibration. It will eventually launch tiny cube satellites into polar orbit. Before there were cars, uh, there were trains, and that's how it is in space. Right now, there are freight trains in space, like SpaceX and ULA. There are medium-sized companies and rockets that are launching, I would call them buses to space, but we want to be the Uber to space. Anyone doubting Maine's ability to become a key player in the 21st century space industry needs only to glance at the history books. During the Cold War with Russia, this windswept winter wilderness was America's front line of defense. Hello! Hello! Tim McCabe owns the Bunk Inn, a converted officer's barracks on the old Loring Air Force Base. He also has the keys to the massive hangar where the B-52 bombers were once maintained. The reason they established Loring here is because it is the closest point to Russia over the horizon. So that the start of the Cold War, uh, they were actually operational here with, with bombing capability in 1949. Maine has other redundant military bases and some 50 companies already working in the aerospace industry. It's hoped Blue Shift's success will boost plans to create a new spaceport complex. This is Jane O'Brien reporting from May. You're listening to the BBC World Service. I'm Julian Marshall and this is News Hour. And let's return to Myanmar, uh, once again under military rule after five brief years of democracy. Uh, the army moved against de facto leader Aung San Suu Kyi and her National League for Democracy in the early hours of Monday morning because it claims their landslide victory in last November's elections was rigged. Ms. Suu Kyi and other NLD politicians have been detained. The army has declared a one-year state of emergency, following which it says there'll be fresh elections. David Gamal works for an international NGO based in the capital, Navidor. In a video posted online, he expressed his shock. We are still in disbelief that this happened. And honestly, we really don't know where this coup will lead us to. For me personally, it was my worst nightmare falling right before my eyes. The atmosphere in Abidor is eerily calm, as if we're awaiting the arrival of an imminent storm. The streets are empty as usual, and a few people you see in the street, you can obviously tell from the look on their faces that something awful just happened this morning. Army trucks can be seen here and there. There's been widespread international condemnation of the military coup, and this activist in Yangon, who didn't want to be named, I told the BBC that this is only the latest in a series of traumas experienced by the people of Myanmar. Since 1962, after that, our life were all ruled, our education system, our generations, you know, everything we were militarized since that time. So after 2010, the election is there and the democratic, you know, kind of space opening up, we were hopeful. But after the coup news coming back again, we all feel like we have that fear inside, deeply inside, generation to generation, we all deeply traumatized. And uh, Nian Chan Yai is with the BBC Burmese service in Yangon. Uh, what's it been like in the city today? The streets are quiet in the afternoon. 
just people are not sure what will happen uh, next so they are just staying indoors unless really necessary but earlier in the morning people uh, rush to uh, shops and markets nearby to stock up their basic necessity especially rice and others are uh, stable foods and, and also they are rushing into the uh, ATM and banks and then try to take out money as much as they can and then in the afternoon that the banks are closed and ATM is not working because of the internet shutdown. Um, also phone lines and internet connection is very limited. I, I myself, my mobile phone is not working. And when did people first become aware that uh, the army was carrying out a coup? Just early morning in the around 4 or 3 a.m. and then all some of the um, mobile data and internet connection was down in Nipido and Upper Myanmar, Upper Burma. And then and so um, all over the country, the, the detained um, member of parliament, elected member of parliament and the politicians, they, they started uh, posting in their uh, social media and then the people started aware it. But the official announcement, announcement came only a few hours later on. And then in the, the military owned TV called Nyawadi and that they announced it, the state of emergency and then that they said that they're taking over the country's sovereignty and then all the power. The, the military taking over, I wouldn't imagine, would be very popular among most Burmese. Because of the uh, long lasting legacy of the, that military dictatorship, uh, so we have been under a dictatorship for the uh, almost uh, 50 or 60 years and then uh, we actually uh, started this kind of the democratic transitions uh, 10 years ago and then uh, so even then that 10 years the military still have a power you know so um, people are used to it, that kind of treatment I would say but because of the for the past 10 years and then this they free they enjoy kind of the freedom uh, freedom of speech, all freedom of movement, everything. So now it suddenly seems like it's gone. So I don't see any uh, anti-protest will come in immediately because uh, when military detain people, they also detain not just the high government official, they also detain the, some of the prominent activists, you know, the human rights activists, democracy activists, they also detain those kind of key activists so uh, well, they plan it they plan it out and then they do it like uh, strategically so at the moment just outside only the, the general people you know uh, only the layman people are here and then they their main concern is their own, own family and the, themselves so at the moment uh, only you can see the on in the street is a kind of the pro-military campaign you know so some of the uh, so-called nationalists after a nationalist group, they are doing like a uh, celebration in, in the streets, in the downtown. So there are people out on the streets of Yangon celebrating the military takeover? Yes, celebrating military campaign. Just all, a few people so-called, they proclaim themselves as a nationalist and then they see the army or military is the safeguard of the country by race and religion. And um, I, with the BBC's Burmese service in Yangon, in neighboring Thailand, some members of the Burmese community there gathered outside the Myanmar embassy in Bangkok. They held placards of Aung San Suu Kyi and burnt pictures of Myanmar's army chief chanting, We don't want Min Aung Lai. <laughs> Meanwhile, the United Nations has led the international condemnation of the coup, followed by Western governments and the European Union. The UN Special Rapporteur on Myanmar, Tom Andrews, told the BBC that the coup was an assault on democracy. It's just outrageous. It's uh, deeply disturbing. Um, we're still getting information from Myanmar. The communication lines have been uh, have been cut, so there's a lot that we that we don't know. But what we do know is that. Uh, uh, Democracy has been uh, overturned by by the generals. Uh, many people uh, are now in uh, in detention. Um, the constitution that the generals uh, wrote, um, and that they uh, pledged just 48 hours ago to fully abide by, has now been uh, been overturned. 
there's been a more muted response uh, from China, which has strong links with the military in Myanmar, although it has also worked with Aung San Suu Kyi. Uh, Wang Wen then is Beijing's foreign ministry spokesperson. We have seen what is happening in Myanmar, and we are furthering our understanding of the situation. China is Myanmar's friendly neighbor. We hope all sides in Myanmar can appropriately manage their differences under the constitution and the legal framework to uphold political and social stability. The United States has also called for the release of Aung San Suu Kyi and other NLD politicians and for the military to respect the outcome of last November's elections. Derek Mitchell is a former American ambassador to Myanmar during the Obama administration and he joins us live now. Um, Ambassador, certainly uh, head of this coup, the Biden administration, or rather the White House, was warning that uh, action would be taken against those uh, responsible. What action can be taken? Well, I mean, the the uh, impulse is always to send uh, a tangible signal through targeted sanctions um, towards the military and those who perpetrated this. <clears throat> That's the usual kind of response, but I think they're looking at a whole host of different potential uh, policy responses to try to see if there's a way to engage this uh, and reverse this, uh, though it looks like right now the sink and the military are digging in. I mean, why would General Min Ong Lang do this, given the sort of opposition he'll face at home and is already facing abroad? And that's a big question, because the common wisdom was he was getting what he wanted in previous system, which was not a full democracy, it was just a democratic opening, where civilians had responsibility for the economy and for a lot of the problems of the country and the military's interests were still protected. Uh, why would he want to own this country at this moment where they're undergoing just a, an incredibly difficult economic and health situation? It's difficult to understand, but, but uh, there are a few things that might provide clues. He was... Um, slated to retire in July, and it was no secret that he wanted to stay somewhere in power, uh, have some kind of authority past July, and that didn't seem to be in the cards for the election. He also had, he and the military had tremendous animus uh, built up against Aung San Suu Kyi personally, and it seems to have just boiled over in this case. I mean, why would that be, given that she went out to uh, bat for them? in international forums and uh, defend the military against what had happened in Rakhine State? Well, in private, the relationship was much worse than it may have seemed in public. I think she felt perhaps that she was defending the honor of the country, that she was the leader and she wanted to demonstrate that to the people of the country and the military in the way she handled the Rohingya issue. But behind the scenes, there is really no love lost over time. They're just two personalities that didn't get along very well. Um, you know, in, in Burma, it's very much about, are you, can I trust you and are you my friend? And if not, oftentimes it means you're my enemy. Uh, and they just, you know, it just seemed to get worse and worse in recent days and really over the past five years. I mean, would you reckon the military going to keep her and her colleagues uh, detained for the next year during this period of emergency? I think it's very likely. I think they, they fear what she represents. It's clear from the, the election. Uh, last year, that she retains the same type of overwhelming support from the people. Uh, and as suggested by one of the commentators before I came on, um, the, the leadership has now been detained, and I think that was done not just in, in government but civil society in order to uh, prevent any galvanizing of popular outrage. Um, so it's very likely you're not going to see some of these folks in public for some time. Uh, China's senior diplomat was in uh, Myanmar and uh, met the military leadership, I think, last month and heard them out over their complaints about the conduct of the election. Um, would China nonetheless be dismayed at what has happened? I don't know that they'll be dismayed. I think they might be a little confused. It's, it's interesting and, and try to figure out what it means for them. They simply care to have uh, influence and access to the Indian Ocean through Myanmar and through Burma to get access to resources and to have ability to invest. Uh, they do not have a very good relationship with the military, the Burmese military. So they're probably trying to figure out what this means for them. And to the degree that the international community isolates the military, they may see a, an opportunity here. So you speak of isolation, uh, and you would imagine that the U.S. could go beyond targeted sanctions? 
Uh, it's unclear. Uh, I doubt. I think they're, they're very. The Biden administration is trying not to go back to the old ways of simply sanctioning the entire country. <clears throat> but I do think there's um, a desire to figure out a more um, complicated way, a more complex way to deal with a complex situation. So typically it's targeting on those who committed these acts, uh, try and maintain some engagement and some leverage and some channel of communication. Um, and then hopefully wean them, you know, if, if it's a year or shorter to try to to move this back on a democratic path, but it just doesn't look very good right now. Ambassador, many thanks. That was uh, Derek uh, Mitchell, a former American ambassador to uh, Myanmar during the Obama administration, commenting there on the military coup that has uh, taken place in Myanmar. Now, let's look at what else you can hear from the BBC World Service. In 10 minutes, today's guest on Hard Talk is the Saudi academic and exiled opposition activist, Madawi al-Rashid. The business opportunities, the investment opportunities are not going to happen if there is no change of behavior in, in the, at the top level. And at bbcworldservice.com, listen to our series looking at saving our planet. People truly realize that we will not reach net zero by 2050 if we do not tackle sustainable energy by 2030. And find out what's been going on in the US in When Catty Met Carlos. We are growing increasingly concerned about how the effects of the pandemic are being experienced psychologically by everyone across the aid spectrum. Hear more at bbcworldservice.com. Now it's back to Julian Marshall and NewsHour. A reminder of our top story this hour, there's unease and anger in Myanmar after the military seized power detaining the country's democratically elected leaders, including Aung San Suu Kyi. Uh, the prominent Burmese author and historian, Thant Nguyen Du, told News Hour the coup appeared to be a reaction by the armed forces to their decreasing influence in Myanmar's politics in recent years. Many of them could never have imagined that you know, Aung San Suu Kyi, who had been their arch nemesis for a generation and her national need for democracy, would actually be the party that would be cohabiting government with them. So for an institution that for decades has been completely in power in a dictatorship, even a little bit of pushback has the potential of upsetting them quite a lot. Also this hour, a leading international aid official, Jan Egerland, says restrictions placed on humanitarian efforts in Ethiopia's Tigray region are among the worst he's seen in a 40-year career. You're listening to the BBC World Service. I'm Julian Marshall, and this is News Hour. There was a time when Aung San Suu Kyi was lionized in the West for the privations she suffered during her long fight for democracy in Myanmar, and there was general acclaim when her party won elections in 2015. She has, though, only ever been the de facto leader of the country, with the military continuing to exercise considerable influence. But it was under her watch in 2017, the army undertook a murderous campaign in Rakhine State, forcing hundreds of thousands of Rohingya Muslims to flee to neighboring Bangladesh, where they remain to this day. And rather than condemn the military, Aung San Suu Kyi dismayed her international supporters by defending uh, the military against accusations of genocide. Joel Wynn is founder of the Burma Human Rights Network. He's a Muslim, but not ethnically Rohingya. What does it mean for Rohingya Muslims that the military is now back in full control? Not only for Rohingya, but most of all the minorities. This is really bad news and devastating situation for them. This is the military who breached the human rights violations and who commit the, this kind of crime, this crime against humanity or crime against or genocide or all this kind of crime committed by the military. So when they are in charge, it's, it's like uh, uh, the sheep are now going to look after by the wolf. But you seem to be suggesting that Aung San Suu Kyi and her NLD party were, were some kind of restraint on the military, that they acted in a different way because mm -hmm. there was ostensibly yeah. a civilian government. But, but that's not the case, is it? 
yes, when she was in the power, uh, when there was a genocide happened, the way she have handled it, this was really frustrating, especially for the Rohingya people who's, who have lost their family. And she didn't show her humanity side, you know, and her sympathy. And she has failed her moral duty on Rohingya people. And this is the price that Rohingya and other minority have paid heavy price for this. What is likely to be there for the reaction of those Rohingya Muslims still in Myanmar? Currently, there are nearly 600,000 Rohingya inside the Hansik and their life is really in danger now. The military, they will do whatever they can and they want to do because even they committed genocide, the heinous crime. What is the reaction? What is the consequence they are facing? They have nothing. You know, they just have a, they just face symbolic action by the Western countries. So they have lost their loved one. You know, their life has been devastated and they become a landowners to become a refugees and destitute now. But for the military, they still remain the same as before. They make more money, they make more, you know, influence and they never face any consequences for the crime they have committed. How is the military today going to behave any differently uh, to what it did, for instance, in 2017, when Aung San Suu Kyi was the de facto leader of the country? How is it going to be different? A military is always the same. When they consider to eliminate someone, they will do it. And even in 2017, it was not Aung San Suu Kyi who gave order to commit to kill and to destroy this village. That was the military, the military man, the main online, he's general main online, he's the one who now in charge. He is the one who give the order. So he is the one number one responsibility for the genocide. And now he's in charge of Burma. So do you expect a resumption of the military campaign in Rakhine State? The real threat is the six hundred thousand Rohingya people. Why it is because they have no no one to protect their life. For example, for Rakhine people, they have arms group. It's very strong, right? Every ethnic minority have their own arms group, except Rohingya. Rohingya has no one. So the Rohingyas are very much vulnerable for the military. They can, they can, anytime they can eliminate them. That's Joel Wynn, founder of the Burma Human Rights Network. And let's end by speaking to the BBC's Nick Beek, who until last year was our correspondent in Myanmar. And uh, Nick, do you expect it to be gloves off now for the military and the battle against the Rohingyas and other ethnic minorities in Myanmar now that uh, Aung San Suu Kyi has been deposed? June, I think it's very hard to disagree with a lot of what Jorwin was saying to you just a short time ago. The plight of the Rohingya looks even more precarious today, and that is both for the one million Rohingya Muslims living in the terrible conditions in the in the camps across the border in Bangladesh and as we've been hearing the 600,000 Rohingyas who are denied citizenship, denied access to healthcare education in Rakhine State. I can tell you I've been to both places and it's a grim existence whether you're living uh, across the border in Bangladesh or in uh, in Rakhine State within Myanmar. I mean today we heard from Dil Mohammed, a man I met some two and a half years ago, speaking to him through barbed wire. He's been urging the international community today to restore democracy at any cost. The, the tragic thing is, Julian, he's been sending out that message for three years now and it seems to be falling on deaf ears. I mean, we heard from the former US ambassador to Myanmar earlier on that kind of personal relations have broken down by him between Aung San Suu Kyi and uh, the army chief, Min Aung Lan. Is that something you felt when you were in the country? Yes, I think there was definitely a, a parallel universe in a way. You had a, a two-track system of government. The military, it was clear in everything I did, all the reporting I did, it was approved by the military. The, the army have control of three key ministries. We've heard throughout the program how they have this this effective veto in the parliament and it, what, what really struck me as interesting today despite the, the, the bad blood clearly between the two sides Aung San Suu Kyi has provided a lightning rod for the international criticism over the past few years when it comes to the Rohingya crisis, the Rohingya genocide as so many people say it is now if they embark on further atrocities, further campaigns against the Rohingya Muslims in Rakhine State, if the military do that I don't think they'll be able to, to blame it on Aung San Suu Kyi or be able to s sit back 
and let her take all the international flak if she is going to be languishing under house arrest. So I think that's an interesting dy dynamic that's emerged from the last 24 hours. And tell us a little bit, Nick, before you go, about um, the man who's engineered all this, the army chief, Min Aung Lung. Yes, I mean, he's a man whose political ambition has been quite carefully uh, noted. I mean, he hasn't made any secret of the fact that he would like to be the president. He'd like to be the man in control of the country, not just the military. I mean, previous sort of profiles of the man who we, we don't really get to know much about have suggested someone who was rather unspectacular as a cadet, as a, a middle-ranking officer, but was seen as the anointed candidate to, to take the military helm, and he, he did that a good 10 years ago and it would seem now that we're potentially